Chapter thirty four The Letter Armand sat in the armchair in front of the fire. His head rested against one hand. In the other he held the letter written by the friend whom he had betrayed. Twice he had read it now, and already was every word of that minute, clear writing graven upon the innermost fibres of his body, upon the most secret cells of his brain. Armand, I know. I knew even before Chauvelin came to me, and stood there hoping to gloat over the sole agony of a man who finds that he has been betrayed by his dearest friend. But that damned reprobate did not get that satisfaction, for I was prepared. Not only do I know, Armand, but I understand. I, who do not know what love is, have realized how small a thing is honour, loyalty, or friendship, when weighed in the balance of a loved one's need. To save Jeanne you sold me to Heron and his crowd. We are men, Armand, and the word forgiveness has only been spoken once these past two thousand years, and then it was spoken by divine lips. But Marguerite loves you, and mayhap soon you will be all that is left her to love on this earth. Because of this she must never know. As for you, Armand, well, God help you, but meseems that the hell which you are enduring now is ten thousand times worse than mine. I have heard your furtive footsteps in the corridor outside the grated window of this cell, and would not then have exchanged my hell for yours. Therefore, Armand, and because Marguerite loves you, I would wish to turn to you in the hour that I need help. I am in a tight corner, but the hour may come when a comrade's hand might mean life to me. I have thought of you, Armand, partly because, having taken more than my life, your own belongs to me, and partly because the plan which I have in my mind— will carry with it grave risks for the man who stands by me. I swore once that never would I risk a comrade's life to save mine own. But matters are so different now. We are both in hell, Armand, and I, in striving to get out of mine, will be showing you a way out of yours. Will you retake possession of your lodgings in the Rue de la Croix Blanche? I should always know then where to find you on an emergency. But if at any time you receive another letter from me, be its contents what they may, Act in accordance with the letter, and send a copy of it at once to Folks or to Marguerite. Keep in close touch with both of them. Tell her that I so far forgave your disobedience, there was nothing more, that I may yet trust my life and mine honour in your hands. I shall have no means of ascertaining definitely whether you will do all that I ask, but somehow, Armand, I know that you will. For the third time Armand read the letter through. But Armand— he repeated, murmuring the words softly under his breath, "'I know that you will.' Prompted by some indefinable instinct, moved by a force that compelled, he allowed himself to glide from the chair on to the floor, on to his knees. All the pent-up bitterness, the humiliation, the shame of the past few days, surged up from his heart to his lips in one great cry of pain. "'My God!' he whispered. "'Give me the chance of giving my life for him.' Alone and unwatched, he gave himself over for a few moments to the most voluptuous delight of giving free rein to his grief. The hot Latin blood in him, tempestuous in all its passions, was firing his heart and brain now with the glow of devotion and of self-sacrifice. The calm, self-centred Anglo-Saxon temperament, the almost fatalistic acceptance of failure without reproach, yet without despair, which Percy's letter to him had evidenced in so marked a manner, was, mayhap— somewhat beyond the comprehension of this young enthusiast, with pure Gallic blood in his veins, who was ever wont to allow his most elemental passions to sway his actions. But though he did not altogether understand, Armand Saint-Just could fully appreciate. All that was noble and loyal in him rose triumphant from beneath the devastating ashes of his own shame. Soon his mood calmed down, his look grew less wan and haggard, Hearing Jeanne's discreet and mouse-like steps in the next room, he rose quickly and hid the letter in the pocket of his coat. She came in, and inquired anxiously about Marguerite. A hurriedly expressed excuse from him, however, satisfied her easily enough. She wanted to be alone with Armand, happy to see that he held his head more erect to-day, and that the look as of a hunted creature had entirely gone from his eyes. She ascribed this happy change to Marguerite— finding it in her heart to be grateful to the sister for having accomplished what the fiancé had failed to do. For a while they remained together, sitting side by side, speaking at times, but mostly silent, 
seeming to save for the return of truant happiness. Armand felt like a sick man who has obtained a sudden surcease from pain. He looked round him with a kind of melancholy delight on this room which he had entered for the first time less than a fortnight ago, and which already was so full of memories. Those first hours spent at the feet of Jeanne Lange, how exquisite they had been, how fleeting in the perfection of their happiness! Now they seemed to belong to a far distant past, evanescent like the perfume of violence, swift in their flight like the winged steps of youth. Blakeney's letter had effectually taken the bitter sting from out his remorse, but it had increased his already over-heavy load of inconsolable sorrow. Later in the day he turned his footsteps in the direction of the river, to the house in the Quai de la Ferrée, above the saddler's shop. Marguerite had returned alone from the expedition to the Rue de Charon, Whilst Sir Andrew took charge of the little party of fugitives and escorted them out of Paris, she came back to her lodgings in order to collect her belongings, preparatory to taking up her quarters in the house of Lucas, the old clothes-dealer. She returned also because she hoped to see Armand. "'If you care to impart the contents of the letter to me, come to my lodgings to-night,' she had said. All day a phantom had haunted her, the phantom of an agonizing suspicion. But now the phantom had vanished, never to return. Armand was sitting close beside her, and he told her that the chief had selected him amongst all the others to stand by him inside the walls of Paris until the last. "'I shall, mayhap, thus close that precious document, have no means of ascertaining definitely whether you will act in accordance with this letter. But somehow, Armand, I know that you will.' "'I know that you will, Armand,' reiterated Marguerite fervently. She had been only too eager to be convinced. The dread, arid, dark suspicion, which had been like a hideous, poisoned sting, had only vaguely touched her soul. It had not gone in very deeply. How could it, when in its death-dealing passage it encountered the rampart of tender, almost motherly love? Armand, trying to read his sister's thoughts in the depths of her blue eyes, found the look in them limpid and clear. Percy's message to Armand had reassured her, just as he had intended that it should do. Fate had dealt over harshly with her as it was, and Blakeney's remorse for the sorrow which he had already caused her was scarcely less keen than Armand's. He did not wish her to bear the intolerable burden of hatred against her brother, and by binding St. Just close to him at the supreme hour of danger, he hoped to prove to the woman whom he loved so passionately that Armand was worthy of trust. End of chapter 34